uh, I'm actually going to be talking about three different things, the first two of which are fairly closely related, and the third is thrown in because there was a, I, I was told I was supposed to have a speech part, so there's a speech part. Um, th the first part is about eliminating untrustworthy machine output from research data sets, but really it's a kind of an appeal for help in what I think is a very exciting opportunity in digital humanities. The second is a, whoops, uh, related thing about improving productivity and quality in semi-automatic annotation by Benner Management of the Human Machine Division of Labor, and I'll cite results that involve a two order of magnitude increase in productivity. And then the third will be a, an, a simple example of adjusting machine output toward human annotation norms. So first, for the first one, the context is studies of historical syntax, and I'd first like to explain to you why the people who do ex historical syntax need the very large amounts of data that are now becoming available through the digitization of books and other historical manuscripts. <clears throat> so if we look at the optional deletion of that in English, that is, uh, um, uh, I think I'm going to leave versus I think that I'm going to leave, the that is optional. Uh, we can see if we plot against time, the fraction of that deletion after several different words said up here nearly 100% for a couple of hundred years, um, say suggested down here uh, beginning um, before 1900 at nearly 0% and coming up into the general range of 50% recently and other words in between. This is data from the Corpus of Historical American English, which is about 40 million words a year from 1820 on forward, selected by a method that I'm going to say a little bit more about later uh, by Mark Davies at um, Brigham Young University. Now we can see a similar pattern in the Google Books data set. Um, thought uh, has been, has had a high percentage for a long time, asserted remains very low, suggested is in between, and so on and also for inflected forms. Now if we look in the Corpus of Historical American English at the counts for suggested that, he, she, they, we can see that um, in, as we go decade by decade, until actually we get up past 1900, the number of examples that we have to work with is sort of marginal. So do we really believe in 1820, the one and zero? Well, not really. How strongly do we believe in 1850, 12 and one? Well, that's a little bit better. Um, by the time we've got up to 1960, 71, 39, that's more, more those are more serious statistics. We believe the percentages. Um, and uh, what is the number of words involved? Well. Back here, it's only about 7 million words, 14 million words, 16, and so on. And then we're getting into the 25 million word per decade range later on. So the conclusion here is that for this, in, this kind of investigation, 20 odd million words per decade is actually marginal. That's giving us about enough counts that we can conclude something about historical change. So here's another simple example, contraction of will not to won't and do not to don't. And uh, again, taking data from COHA, from Corpus of Historical American English, the percent of contraction has, it has been increasing steadily since the early 19th century um, with the contraction of do not always being a little bit ahead of the contraction of will not um, in published books. But how about a set of contraction about contractions in a set of sources. Well, when I wrote this, it was last week. It was actually in June. Um, so these are real estate listings from Trulia.com. So uh, you, will not, you will not want to miss this wonderful home in sought after Martin Manor. Um, classic 1920s brick bungalow in historic West End with energy features that will not drain your pockets, and so on. So these are ones where they don't contract, and then here's some that do contract. Hurry, this one won't last long. You won't find a street like this anywhere in Buckhead. 
That's presumably Atlanta, I think, is where Buckhead is. Don't wait, an investment you won't regret, and so on for do not and don't not. So I, I scraped from Trulia.com all of the real estate listings available in June 2013 for 12 cities, actually, but 10 at the time that I wrote this. And so now let's plot these. This is the same data that you saw before, except now I'm, I'm plotting the percentage of don't contraction on the x-axis and the percentage of won't contraction on the y-axis. And you can see that starting from the beginning and going to the present time, after a little bit of fussing around, basically due to low numbers of counts, we're getting a steady correlated movement of will not and won't uh, and do not contraction from very low values to nearly, to, well, to 80% or so in this material. Um, so since the, the last number up here, I don't know if you can see it, is 2005, or at least that's the center of the last decade, which is 2000 to 2010. And since I collected all of my data in 2013, all of those 10 cities ought to be crowded up in this upper right-hand corner, right? Not quite. So we find, for example, that Los Angeles is approximately at the 1820 stage for uh, don't contraction and approximately at the 1860 stage for, for uh, won't contraction. Um, Denver is substantially ahead on both scores, but basically the, there isn't even that strong a positive correlation among these cities and they're kind of spread out all over the map. So what does this mean? Uh, by the way, these are the numbers and the total words. And so even for these very common uh, do not, will not, don't, won't things, um, the numbers are smaller than we would like for many of these cities, even though there's 100,000 or more in most cases uh, from the listings that I was able to harvest. And again, the conclusion is that in this case, 100,000 words per source is marginal, and 10 sources are really not enough to get a stable estimate of the overall pattern. And in fact, what we're seeing in that historical progression is a kind of average among things. If we were to dig down in one decade and look at what's happening, we would see genres and registers and writers, um, sources, newspaper, um, uh, uh, style sheets, and so on that were all over the map with, e with respect to each of those things. Now here are some of the available collections for studying the history of English. The Penn Helsinki Parsed Corpus of Early Modern English is about 1.7 million words over 210 years, but there's only 488, tech, 448 texts over 210 years, so it's approximately two texts per year, or about, um, f um, about 20 texts per decade. And from everything that we've seen, for many of the things that we'd like to estimate, both the word count is too small and the number of alternative sources is way too small. We're, we're getting a lot of noise as a result of those things. Um, Early English Books Online has 125,000 texts over 220 years. That's a much better sort of thing. Um, it's partly curated, about 40,000 texts are done, not published yet, but phase one, the first 25,000 texts will be available in a couple of years. Um, the Corpus of Historical American English we saw is 400 million words, 100,000 texts, um, 18th century collection online and so on. The Hathi Trust has 10 million texts over 400 years. 31% uh, of which they're willing to let anybody get at, and the others, the libraries, have put some restrictions on. Uh, we'll see some problems with that material in a minute. Internet Archive has probably pretty much all of Hathi Trust's public domain stuff, that is, a few million texts. Um, now, if we were interested in the history of syntax in Old English and on into Middle English or in Classical Latin or the history of Sanskrit or something like that, we're just stuck. The extant texts are limited and, and it's pretty much all out there by now. But for English since 1500 or so, where a lot of things have been happening, and for many other languages, there are hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of books every year that are now becoming available in digital form. So what's the problem? Well, bad optical character recognition. I don't know how many of you have looked at what the texts in, say, the Gallica collection at the Bibliothèque Nationale Française look like, or the texts from the Hathi Trust. We'll see some in a moment. 
There's problematic metadata, additions and genres and authors and dates and so forth. Uh, lack of annotation because you would like to know what it is that is in these materials. Headings, captions, marginalia, foreign language quotes, quotes from earlier authors. Um, so old book optical character recognition is usually bad optical character recognition. Uh, this is a, a small snip from uh, the Internet Archives text of Henry Kaner's A Candid Examination of Dr. Mayhew's Observations whoops, on the Charter and Conduct of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, 1763. And you can sort of read it, except in places where you can't. But machine parsing, machine processing of this material is going to require some creativity, to say the least. And actually, it would be better to go back and do the OCR right. As we'll see in a minute, um, for some reason, the community of people who do OCR have not learned the lessons that the people in speech research have learned about language modeling. And I haven't, I've had arguments about this with, some of you may know OCR people, but they're convinced that, that for them to do the right thing would be wrong. And I, n none of them have yet made a coherent argument to me about why this is so. They say, well, you know, if we use language models, then we would make some mistakes. But <laughs> you're making lots of mistakes as it is. Um, there's choice of editions and sources. So if we were interested in Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, uh, it was written in 1781 and published originally in Paris in 1785, first public edition in 1787 in London. The Hati Trust actually has nine versions um, published between 1801 and 1894. The Internet Archive has 12 versions between 1787 and 1955, at least according to the metadata they have, which is not always right. Um, there are images of the original manuscript online at the Massachusetts Historical Society. If you were going to be making up a historical archive, you don't want to have Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia entered as a text composed in 1894, because it wasn't composed in 1894, and there are some even later editions that you might find around. Um, there is, in this case, a careful e-text version of the 1787 edition at the University of Virginia Electronic Text Center. Um, you could, uh, um, this is just comparing those two versions for a particular region, so you can see actually how bad the Hati Trust's OCR is, which is done by a commercial OCR system, which is supposed to be the best commercially available OCR system, believe it or not. Um, there is some opportunity for a system or version combination. Here are two different um, uh, OCR versions. Uh, this one is from the Internet Archive. Uh, this one is from Google Books. Google Books has gone a little bit too far in changing long S's that look like F's into S's and has changed some F's into S's. So it has intersections instead of imperfections. And again, you would sort of think they would have a language model that would tell them you know, when to do that and when not to do it, since actually in, imperfections is not even in the OED. But anyway, so we need an organized effort to select texts and sources, to correct metadata and texts, to annotate text structure and linguistic structure. There's lots of text in decent shape for training purposes. Um, OCR for older books sucks. It could be improved by better font training and better language models. There is a decent quality open source um, OCR system with trainable fonts and so forth called Tesseract, available from Google Code. And so uh, um, if any of you, if you, if any of you are or know someone who is interested or perhaps is whoops, already doing this, um, please let me know because I know a few people who are sort of with their left hand at least working on this problem who come from the speech side and therefore have a sensible attitude towards the introduction of language modeling into optical character recognition. Um, meanwhile, <laughs> I just disconnected it. I think it should be all right now. Um, one thing that language modeling can trivially do, and this has actually been done, um, is to distinguish decent OCR from terrible OCR. So you've seen those things before. Just put them into a halfway plausible language model and ask, what is the posterior probability of this being English? 
and, <laughs> and the distribution ought to separate you know, better stuff from worse stuff fairly nicely. At least the really bad stuff will score quite badly. Um, and so this ought to make it possible to flush the most terrible OCR from our data sets. And that's actually what Mark Davies did for the uh, um, historical corpus, uh, the corpus of historical American English. Um, he used texts that he was able to get from places like the Hathi Trust and from the, the uh, texts made available by Google Books. And then he just ran a very, very simple-minded language model over them and rejected all the ones that fell whose scores fell below some threshold. And that may be introducing some bias into his selection, but at least it means that the quality of the texts for the older period is reasonable. Um, and even just that much could be a help because suppose we had 1,000 books a year for 250 years, that would be 250,000 books. Um, that would be 77% of the Hathi Trust's public domain books, which is about 3.7 3 3 million or something. So we could eliminate the worst 93% of the out outputs even without fixing up the OCR and still maybe have what we would like, assuming that 7% of them are even any good. Okay, next thing. Improving productivity and quality and semi-automatic annotation by better management of the human machine division of labor. Tree banking, creating parse text corpora is something you've probably all heard about. More recently, especially, there's some semantic annotations that are added as well. So-called prop banking tells you who did what to whom. There, there can be some sense disambiguation on the words that tells you uh, you know, which word sense, which of some standard word sense uh, division each word belongs to. Um, and the existence of such tree banks, starting with the Penn Tree Bank 20 years ago, has been the basis for progress in stochastic parsing algorithms, which has been quite strong. Um, the Penn English Tree Bank was an important first step. In recent years, um, I, this is not my opinion, but what I hear from other people in related fields, parsing is increasingly seen, although not by everyone, as foundational for machine translation, information retrieval, information extraction from text, and other kinds of things, largely because there are now efficient, fast, stochastic parsers for many languages that do a pretty decent job. They're pretty good. And there's ongoing production of tree banks in new languages, in new genres and registers, but there's a problem, which is that tree banking is hard to learn. It takes something like three to six months of training to make a competent tree bank annotator. And actually, some people apparently never get it, and uh, um, some people more cynical than I believe that only 5% of the population is capable of becoming a competent tree banker. I, I'm reluctant to believe this of my fellow humans. Um, but anyway, not everyone likes it and not everyone is good at it and even those who like it and are good at it <laughs> take some time to learn to do it properly because the annotation manuals tend to be rather long and it seems to turn out to be true that consistency is actually important to the quality of the final the applications derived from the final result. Um, it's slow even after training. The productivity for the original Penn Tree Bank was approximately 100 words per labor hour, which is pathetic, but that's what it took. Um, and it's hard to develop good standards for tree banks. Uh, the Penn Tree Bank took three tries. And the Arabic tree bank, more recently produced, required a complete revision kind of after it was first done because the users complained that certain things were done in a way that, made, that was bad from the point of view of training parsers and also some inconsistencies. Um, there are an increasingly large number of historical tree banks which are not as widely known among engineers in computational linguistics as they deserve to be. And I've listed five of them here. There are some other ones um, starting basically in historical order. So there's a corpus of Old English prose, which is about a million and a half words. There's a parsed corpus of Middle English, which is about 1.2 million words. There's a parsed corpus of Early Modern English, which is 1.7 million words. There's an, a corpus of early English correspondence, which is 2.2 million words. And most recently, there's a parsed corpus of modern British English, where modern is like 1700 to 1900, um, which is uh, 1 million words. 
um, and I've listed the authors and tree bankers, authors and annotators there. Um, in this area, actually, I think the digital humanities represented by such historical tree banks are actually ahead of the engineers uh, for reasons that I'll explain on the next slide. Um, there's been an ongoing commitment of dedicated people to the creation of historical tree banks f going on 20 years now. So the same people have been involved in doing it in a very serious way and trying to do it better and trying to get thing, trying to make their work more productive uh, over that period of time, whereas the other tree banks tend to start and work on a, fa on a, a fast timeline and then kind of dissipate and uh, start up again later. Um, and there's also not much money available in the digital humanities in comparison, and so there's more uh, evolutionary pressure to uh, um, become more efficient at doing the tree banking. So the results is that I think, the results are, I think in the first place, that the quality of the annotation in the historical tree banks is actually better. So if you look through them and look at consistency and other measures of quality, it's, they're actually uh, better done. Um, but most important, the productivity is really much greater. Um, in particular, as I'll explain in a moment, um, for the, the corpus of modern British English, um, the uh, average um, that Beatrice Santorini achieved was something like um, 15,000 words per hour compared to 100 words per hour for the original pen tree bank. So that's quite a substantial improvement. How did they do that? Well, um, it's not, it's, not very high tech, I would say, and a little bit of technical, uh, a, a little bit, it's, there are some high tech aspects, but a little bit of additional um, technical support of a kind or technical uh, um, intervention of a kind that I'll mention, I think would help even more. But the first thing is uh, focused pre-annotation before the automatic parsing. The way that this has always been done is you run a parser and then you correct the output of the parser rather than um, uh, doing the parsing from scratch. At least that's, once you have a parser, you do that. Um, this avoids common parser errors and it reduces associated errors as well because the sorts of things I'm gonna talk about, generally when the parser gets them wrong, that's not the only thing that it gets wrong. It gets other things that are associated with that mistake wrong as well. Um, and the pre-annotation is focused precisely on things that are relatively easy for humans to determine and relatively hard for parsers to determine and especially are likely to cause problems um, if the parser gets them wrong. Um, and then the second thing is batch post-editing of parser output via a sort of query replace tree transducer that involves rapid correction of, of repeated patterns of error. Um, so some of the pre-annotations that are currently used are coordinating conjunctions like and and or are tagged for what they can join. Um, and there are various ways of indicating this and the tool for doing it actually could be improved by quite a bit. But the basic idea is simple. You see an and, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a tool that goes through and finds the next and or or for you and highlights it and then you have to tell it, you know, what does it join? because that's something parsers are notoriously bad at. Um, punctuation is treated as a coordinating con uh, conjunction where appropriate because there's some kinds of punctuation, like commas, for example, that sort of come, that, that, that join groups of things. And so in certain cases, at least, commas are, are similarly tagged. That is tagged to distinguish complement clause from relative clause uses. That is the fact that he learned the answer versus the new fact that he learned yesterday. Those are different kinds of clauses that have different kinds of internal structure and different labels and so on, and it's easy for people to tell which it is in a particular case, and you just have to indicate on that word which one it is. Um, silent that is indicated and similarly tagged, so the fact he learned, the fact, the fact he learned the ant, mm, that's not even grammatical, but let's say, uh, um, if, it, if you did see something like the fact he learned the answer, maybe it's okay. Um, you would put in a zero, a null that, and indicate that it's a complementizer. Um, the new fact he learned yesterday, you would put in a zero and indicate that it's a relative 
clause introducer. Um, parenthetical phrases or clauses are explicitly tagged with virtual delimiters. So complicated text especially often has lots of sort of chunks that are kind of interpolated with or without parentheses, sometimes with commas, sometimes with hyphens, sort of in the middle of other stuff. And so when, when the annotators spot one of those, which I think they do just by skimming, I'm, I don't believe that the, uh, maybe the, the tool highlights hyphens for them or something. Uh, and then certain prepositional phrases are tagged for what they modify, <laughs> where it's easy to figure that out quickly. Uh, Beatrice Santorini gave me a few examples of how she uses batch post-editing, post what you might call revision queries, which are used both to correct par parser output and to fix inconsistencies in human annotation, either across annotators or within an annotator. And you can just glance at um, her at what she says. Um, the details probably don't matter very much unless you're uh, a parsing person, but the point is that there are, there are characteristic kinds of errors where over a million words you might have to fix 150 or 200 or even more of a particular kind of error and you, you can, they've written a tool which for those of you who know Unix command line tools is sort of like said for trees. That is, it's a way of, uh, it's a tree transducer. It's a way of giving a sort of regular expression over paths in a tree, and it locates all the things that match that, and then if it matches it, it offers to make a certain kind of systematic change, which you can then tell it to make or not. Um, so as a result, Beatrice can now produce tree bank annotation at a rate of more than 15,000 words per hour. So uh, the 1.5 million words of the uh, um, modern English, modern British English corpus took 100 hours of work with quality as good or better than before. Um, note that, that if we could do this on a broader scale, then for the same investment that produced the one million word pen tree bank, we could produce a hundred million word parsed corpus of many more different genres that would have undoubtedly have a very large impact on parser performance for training parsers, but also the fact that you could look across different genres and it wouldn't all be the Wall Street Journal and so forth um, would be extremely important. Uh, and furthermore, we could probably do somewhat better than Beatrice does now with better error prediction for pre-editing. That is, have some smarter programs that go looking through the text to see, you could even parse the text first and go through and look to see where it's likely that a mistake of a certain kind might have been made. And uh, don't ask where it's not likely that a mistake was made, but ask in cases where a mistake is plausible. Uh, likewise, better post-edit propagation of fixes should improve this even further. Uh, a key fact here is that the pre-annotation steps, most of them should actually be easy for what Fred Jelinek used to call ungrammarians to learn to do. Um, and we've actually tested this out somewhat in the case of indicating scope of conjunction. And in fact, um, it does seem to be the case that ordinary literate people, if you say, okay, here's an and, what are the things that it joins? You know, just sweep them out with the mouse. They can do that pretty well, um, pretty accurately. And they don't, you don't have to teach them about trees and you don't have to teach them about dependency relations. You just ask them, what's the strength, what's the chunk of text that, that the and or the or can joins? And some, somewhat similar kinds of questions can be asked for several of the other kinds of pre-tagging. Um, like those. Um, even without pre-annotation, modern parsers are 85 to 90 percent accurate. Um, looking over what Beatrice and others are doing, it seems that you don't need more than about three human pre-annotators, pre-annotations per sentence um, of a type that's, that are a pre-annotation that's cognitively simple and fairly obvious uh, to pretty much any literate person who understands the sentence. Um, and this should be enough to ensure tree bank quality automatic parsing, given a modest amount of batch post editing for quality and consistency checking. And it should, you know, I think it's not out of the question to imagine that we could improve the productivity of human tree bank creation by two orders of magnitude relative to what it's historically been. Okay, uh, last topic, uh, something about speech, adjusting machine output towards human annotation norms. The goal is accurate 
phone level segmentation of speech, the sort of thing that's, uh, say, done in Timid or Buckeye or some other kinds of things. Um, there are various applications such as speech synthesis and pronunciation modeling and research in phonetics, sociolinguist, psychology of language, and so on. The last of those is the one that, that I'm mainly motivated by at the moment. Um, now, hidden Markov model forced alignment is very robust if it's properly done, but it's not very accurate in detail. If you ask, you know, is it finding the words right? You can put in an hour-long interview, halfway decent transcription, and it's sort of finding the sentences and the words almost all the time pretty reliably. If you ask, is it finding the boundary between one segment and the next? Is it fi can you use it to measure VOT, for example? Uh, you know, can you use it to measure vowel duration or any of the other kinds of things that phoneticians do? It's not so great. Um, so there are various methods that are used to do it better. Um, introduction of special boundary models, that is HMM um, uh, state or state collections generally refer to segments, but you can, between the segments, you can put a model for the change of segments and that turns out to help. Um, you can use different acoustic features that are, you know, that represent the changes better, and we could talk about that, but I won't because it's, there's not enough time here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is what we call correction models, um, which are, in the, in the simplest case, are extremely simple. It just says, well, gee, when we look at the average difference between what the system is producing and what we think we want, the gold standard, um, the mean of those differences is not zero. So if we simply take the mean difference and add it to everything, then we will improve our score relative to the gold standard, at least if that generalizes to the test set. <coughs> That's the stupidest thing we could do. We could do something clever. We could say, all right, let's take knowledge of what the segments are and regress on that and say, all right, you know, when we have a high front vowel followed by a nasal, what's the, what's, what do we predict in that case? And we could add various other kinds of input features to the regression. Uh, and then we can also do system fusion of a kind that's familiar in the speech biz. That is, you have a bunch of systems that work in somewhat different ways and you use Rover or some other technique to put them all together and they all score a little bit better than any one of them does if, if you're lucky. Um, there are a couple papers, one from Interspeech 2013, another recently submitted um, that are uh, attempts to do the typical sort of obsessive compulsive thing that speech people do and, you know, increase by a few tenths of a percent a time, uh, at a time on some um, uh, particularly selected data set. Um, the metric is percent of boundaries between n milliseconds of human segmentation and obviously never mind what the different curves are for the moment. The point is just, you know, if, if 10 milliseconds is the collar, then you're, in this case, in the 70 to 78 percent range, whereas if 50 milliseconds is the collar, you're essentially at 100 percent. And we generally pick 20 milliseconds as the, um, uh, the, the collar, as the tolerance. Um, the idea generally being that um, human annotators differ from one another on average by at least that much. So it's sort of silly. In, I mean, for some, for like burst location, you might want to do better. But for most things, 20 milliseconds is a reasonable compromise value. For some things, humans can't do that well. So here's uh, um, the, a table showing progress. So if we just take a basic, the basic HMM that we're using and we use the numbers that come out of the HMM, that come out of HTK that say what's where, um, the percent that's within 20 milliseconds is 68.3 percent, which is pretty terrible. However, that's mostly because HTK seems to be taking the beginning of the analysis window as the alignment point, and the middle of the analysis window would be a better choice. So if we just offset by 12.5 milliseconds, we're already at 90 percent. So <laughs> that's actually the biggest single improvement, yes, that we've uh, ever gotten. Now, if we add a slightly more clever model 
two linear models, which I'll dis uh, sort of parallel linear models that are linear regression that I'll describe in a moment. One, whoops. Thank you. Uh, one for uh, vowel glide combinations and one for everything else. Uh, we get up to 93.9%. Now we've tried a number of more sophisticated prediction models for doing the correction. So a regression tree isn't quite as good as the linear models. Two neural networks are a little bit better. And then finally, with system combination, we get up to almost 97%. So, you know, we're, I think at, that, I think at this point, we're, we've probably gone beyond, we've, we've more than squeezed all of the available juice out of this particular data set, and I think we're going to stop. At least I certainly hope so. Um, but I want to point out that the improvement due to the error correction model, which is about 3.37% absolute, is large compared to the system combina combination improvement or to the boundary model improvement, which actually isn't shown on here, but was ab about 2%. Um, so this very, very simple idea of just let's try to predict from the na nature of the local transcript that we're aligning how, how much we should shift the judgment, um, which a very simple idea, very easy to implement, is having a, a larger effect than almost anything else. Um, and it's true even for the simple linear regression model, which works like this. This is just quoted from our paper. The boundaries between vowel and glide phonemes are inherently subjective. And then we quote the, the section from the Timid Annotation Manual where they tell people what to do, which is basically to, to figure out what they think the transition region is and go a third of the way into it. Um, so to compensate for this arbitrariness, we built a linear model to correct the forced alignment boundaries, and you can read the details there. It just you know, puts in some fairly obvious features available from the test output, and outputs a number which you just add to the boundary time to change it. Um, that, and that's all we did, and it was not very hard, to say the least. So the conclusions from all of this our first, accurate, es accurate estimation of error rates can be used to purify large data sets. We can take a few million books and boil it down to a couple of hundred thousand books um, that are likely to be a, a better sample of optical character recognition. And perhaps we can do similar kinds of things in other cases. Of course, doing the optical character recognition right would be much, much better. Second, accurate prediction of error location can focus human annotation for large improvements in productivity. And this strikes me as being something that might have broader application. Um, uh, for, for example, in machine translation, perhaps focused pre-annotation of certain things would help the MT get other things right. I don't know if that's true, but it, it seems conceivable. Maybe. Um, some pre-annotation for speech recognition for things like unusual proper names that the system is unlikely to get right might help with the rest of the error rate. I don't know. Uh, thirdly, accurate estimation of error magnitudes can improve performance by automatic correction as in the Timit uh, boundary circumstance. Um, these are all old and obvious points, actually. I think none of them is either new or profound. Um, but I think they have new and potentially large implications in various areas. At least I hope so. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Okay. I have just a, a small comment. Uh, I like very much the idea of system combination, and you said that the new results you gave less this system combination than with the other um, segment. Um, the correction, but yes. But if you, if you translate your absolute values in relative gains, you have more with uh, Well, yes, I thought of that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it's not quite true, because if we did the system combination before doing the error correction, okay. 
um, then the, it would turn around even more in the other direction. And actually, you can do them in either order. We get a better, we did it both ways, I believe, and I, we get a better final number by doing the system combination second mm -hmm. and the error correction first. But if you do them in the other order, it, it, it comes out in relative as well as absolute terms. Well, but, so Tesseract has got a dictionary in it, but it, there's some sort of arcane decision about whether or not to to believe it, and and. That, that, that does make sense because after all there can be out of their out of vocabulary words and there are number strings and there's you know all kinds of stuff that can happen in books and so you don't want to say that nothing that isn't in the dictionary can possibly occur but still um, so again I, I can only speak for tesseract so so the, the really the worst OCR outputs were done by, I think it's called ABBY, which, or ABBYY, maybe anyway, it's a commercial system that, that the Hathi Trust has used and the Internet Archive uses. Now, maybe you can talk with uh, Albert Kinech. They participated to a competition organized the uh, model, and uh, they do uh, model language and the results are... Or it should be much better, yes. Well, uh, but I can speak from, I, I've looked at Tesseract, which is this open source um, system developed by somebody who used to be at HP and is now at Google. And it, I, you know, it's, it's a well-designed industrial s scale piece of software, and it's supposed to have competitive results, at least with the sort of standard uh, available state of the art. And it does have, it has a letter, it has an engram letter language model, it has a dictionary and so on, but it still produces junk. And uh, exactly why that is, is still mysterious to me. But I, I'm absolutely convinced that an appropriate, you know, appropriately clever application of ASR style language modeling te techniques would make an enormous impact in this area. Maybe it's because uh, in the observation, usually, they do divagation line by lines, and they don't uh, work on all the documents uh, at the same time. That's, I, I think that's, that's that could why be. They, they don't choose a, a language model as we do in speech. That could be true. The, the, the last argument I had with an OCR person, they, they made a, what I thought was a reasonable point, along with a bunch of less reasonable points. The reasonable point was that if we were looking at modern texts which w where the font training is better and the printing quality is better and the, the scans are better and the language is the word the word the spelling and so on is more normal and so on in the first place the number of OCR errors is smaller and also the risk of introducing wrong stuff by heavy-handed language modeling is greater so it's, it's more possible to actually make things worse rather than better by applying a language model. But I mean, for the sorts of things that, that these uh, systems are getting in the 16th and 17th and 18th century, um, it would be hard to make them worse. <laughs> and it's possible. But. <laughs> Maybe they just want more materials for the Maybe so, yes. But I mean, wouldn't it make sense to have the OCR be a fixed output that you can then post process and you can blame the image on you know the quality of your original document and then you can do whatever post processing you want. Well there are a lot of people who are well, there are a lot of people who are doing OCR post processing but I I think that's second best that would be like doing speech recognition and producing a phonetic lattice and then a phone lattice and then doing language modeling on top of that. In fact, I'm sorry, it's worse than that. It would be like doing speech recognition and producing a phone string. Yeah. Because the output of the OCR is not a letter lattice, it's a letter string. Actually, people are doing this and really So Okay, well. <laughs> well, just that, you know, you're 
original source, once you build in the language model to the original, you can never get back to the image. So if you have an unknown word, or you're not in the language you think you are, or some issue like that, you've already... Yeah, well, you could, I mean, there's nothing to prevent you from outputting alternatives in cases where you, you're not sure or for, for indicating confidence about regions of the, um, uh, regions of the text and, and all of those things, yeah, some, something like that, all those things can be done. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the power analysis is the right word, and I think it's standard statistics, which I'm not an expert in, but basically, you know, you have some kind of uh, um, complicated and variable process, and you want to know how much data do you need from what combination of circumstances in order to estimate the parameters of the underlying process with what accuracy. And I don't think there's any... It, it's a somewhat complicated case because we're dealing with time functions and so on, but aside from that, I don't think there's anything different about this actually than, than I don't know, say tracking income as a function of gender across regions or something like that. Same sorts of issues apply. Yes? Do you have any idea of how much uh, historical data there is out there that could still be um, available if the proper you know, technology were uh, developed to OCR correctly and stuff like that. Because you kind of like to think that there must be much, much more text out there. If you can just well, the Hathi Trust has 12,000 books or works or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not all books. Some of them are pamphlets and stuff. but. I mean, there are lots 12 million, of problems, you know, that but there's lots of stuff that, that, that they haven't scanned yet. So, yeah. so there's there certainly tens of millions, and that that the Hathi Trust has got some stuff in other languages, but of course it's mostly it's Anglo Anglo centric, and so I'm sure that for European languages and for Japan and China and India, there is uh, vast amounts of uh, so it's, material. It seems like the kind of thing Google should be encouraged to get into, you know. Well, they, I mean, Google Books is, but I mean, uh, there are in it. But more historical data <laughs> yeah. as well. That would be cool. Okay, let's thank the speaker.